Thank you. So, as we're going through the Sermon on the Mount, and with this, the Beatitudes, being salt and light, and even into the law, as we began last week, the law of God, the focus is on us as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, how our life is lived, uh, our influence, our attitudes towards ourselves as citizens before God. And even in the passage today regarding the law of God in the life of the believer, three times it mentions something about that relationship between the kingdom of heaven and our relationship to the law of God. So one of the things that we looked at is that slide for the house, is that up? So we looked at this last week. Uh, the, the Jewish faith is basically the foundation of our Christian faith. And the Old Testament is basically the Jewish holy book. The Jewish holy book, they, our, the Bible, they don't call it the Bible, but uh, is our Old Testament. And the Christian faith is the fulfillment of Judaism or the fulfillment of the Jewish faith. And the New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. I say that because those are of utmost importance that we see the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament, between the Jewish uh, faith and the Christian faith. Remember, we looked at the Jewish law, but it's considered by the Jews to be Jewish law is the Ten Commandments is considered to be the law. Uh, the first five books of the Old Testament, the, the books of Moses, Genesis through Deuteronomy, are considered to be the law. And then all of their holy book, our Old Testament, is often referred to as the law. So when they're referring to the law of God, from their perspective, it kind of depends on the context. Uh, but all of that is referred to uh, the law of God. So I want us to look at this next uh, slide. Uh, we looked at that last week. Next one. And this is, when it comes to law, uh, I, wanted to, I want you to look at this because when we see the Ten Commandments, we know the Ten Commandments. Um, basically, the first four are God-related, uh, directly in our relationship with God. And the last six, the final six, are focused on our relationship with other people, more of our horizontal uh, relationships. Matthew 22 Verse 37 through 39 says, the love, love the Lord your God. What's the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Luke has all four in there. And the second on this side is likened unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Those two lined up perfectly with this, the first four Ten Commandments are focused on loving God. The last six commandments, I'm sorry, the last, yes, yeah, six commandments are focused on loving your neighbor. The second, the ending of verse 39 says, all of the law and the prophets hang on this. All of the law and the prophets, all the Ten Commandments, all the books of Genesis through Deuteronomy, all the books of Moses, all of the Jewish holy book rests on these two commandments. Love the Lord your God. There's that relationship. We have that relationship intact. These other relationships will work themselves out. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your, love your neighbor as yourself. On those two commandments, it sounds like it gets easier. It was ten, now there's two. But on those two commandments, hang all the law of the prophets. Everything is kind of hanging on those two. And then we get to Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. We know it as the golden rule. And it says what? Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. The next phrase is, this is the sum of all the law of the prophets. So upon the two greatest and second greatest commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And according to the golden rule, that one, you treat others the way you would like to be treated, sums up all the law and all the prophets. So we've got ten commandments. We've got two, love, your, love, love the Lord your God, love your neighbor, 
and you got one. Kind of takes us back to the Garden of Eden. You only got one. If you can just do this, things will be great. So we're going to go from there. And today I want you to, if you take anything home today, we're going to take home this principle. And I hope you'll write some of these things down today. And in your bulletin, there are several blanks to fill things out. we got a lot I want you to make sure you uh, go home with today. But a take-home principle for today and it is regarding the law of God, the Old Testament law of God. And I think this is so often what we're missing. I think this is so often in the whole debate, uh, do we believe in the Old Testament? Do we hang on to the Old Testament? Do we unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament? Are we under the law? All of those things, I believe, are problematic because, because something is missing. This is what's missing. The Old Testament law of God is not only about what God expects from us, but also what we can expect from God. We tend to think, well, do's and don'ts. Do this, don't do that. This is what you can do, this is what you don't do. This is what you'll be blessed for, this is what you'll be cursed for. A hammer will come down on you if you do this. And we tend to think these are God's expectations of what we can't do or his expectation for us. But the law of God, the Old Testament law of God is also what we can expect from God. And I think you'll, I think that will kind of dawn on you as we go through this lesson today. So the question that we're trying to answer throughout this series, and this is going to be a little longer than I intended regarding the law of God in the Old Testament, because I believe it's just that important. Because there's so many evangelicals in our culture today that are just kind of disregarding or devaluing or just sort of checking off the Old Testament law. It doesn't apply for us today. We're no longer under law. We're under grace. So our question is, what is the value of the Old Testament law in the life of the believer in Jesus Christ? That's what we asked last week. That's what I hope you have in your notes today. So what is the value of the Old Testament law in the life of the believer in Jesus Christ? I began asking myself that question in a few years ago. I had a, a friend of mine from Bible school who was debating a fellow belonging to the Hebrews Roots religion. Hebrews Roots simplistically is people who believe that they have to go back and live like Noah did, live like Moses did, live like the children of Israel did, and abide by all of the guidelines and laws and statutes and festivals and everything else in order to be right with God. It's what they basically believe. You literally live by the law. And so my friend had this uh, big debate. It was some big church that was, was sort of hosting it. And my friend's name was Jeff. Jeff came as the speaker uh, presenting the Jewish, uh, the Christian faith that were not under the law. And this other guy from the Hebrew move, roots movement uh, was presenting his perspective that if you're a true believer in the Bible, even in Jesus, you have to abide by all the laws of the Old Testament. And so they, you know, it was a, it was a moderated type of a debate. It was real civil. Uh, I thought both, both sides, you know, as far as presentations, did a good job. They were respectful. That's why I look for almost more than anything in a debate. Is it respectful? Um, but after it was over with, I, I contacted my buddy because something was just kind of eating at me. Uh, he, he promoted so much that the Christians are not under the law that I began to wonder, you know, what is the value of the Old Testament then to the Christian from his perspective? I knew where I stood. And so I contacted my buddy Jeff, and we were talking back and forth. I said, you did a great job. You didn't get rattled. You know, very professional, very respectful, appreciate that. Did a great job of presentation. I said, but I want to ask you this. I said, if we're not under the law, if we kind of have to disassociate ourselves with Old Testament law, the Old Testament law of God, I asked, I said, then what is the value of the Old Testament law of God in the life of the believing Christian? 
And he said, well, that's a good question. I'm sure glad they didn't ask me that during the debate. That's, what, that's where he was. After all of that, that spit polish presentation and everything else, to him, he still didn't know where he stood when it comes to what do I do with the Old Testament? If we're not under law and we're under grace, then what do we do as Christians with the Old Testament law of God? So remember this. The Old Testament law of God is not just about what God expects of us, but about what we can expect from God. The Old Testament law of God is not just about what God expects from us, but what we can expect from God. The law of God has always been focused on God is the source of, and the law is God's standard. That's his standard. Standard for who he is. It's a standard for his character. It's a standard for us knowing God. It's also the standard for citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We hear law. We think hindrances. We think restrictions. We think I can't do that. Um, we think of bondage. Oh no, we're not under law. We're, that means we're in bondage to, to the law and we're living by the law and we're saved or, or, or we're getting points with God if we abide by the law. The law is very important. Judges 17 verse 6 says in a, in a very dark time of Israel's past, says in those days there was no king in Israel. And evidently religious leaders weren't doing their job either. In those days, there was no king in Israel, but every man did what was right in his own eyes. Judges 17, verse 6. Every man did what's right in his own eyes. That's what we're left to. If we don't have the law, if we don't have any guidelines, we're left to what we think, and some may even say, how the Holy Spirit leads. But without the Old Testament law of God, we have absolutely no rails on which to keep this train. That's my thoughts and where we're going with this. Psalm 119. Turn to Psalm 119 if you would. Faith was mentioning that a second ago. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. Verses 9 through 18. I want to read it and I want you to do something. I want you to take a pencil or an um, ink pen. I want you to mark things as we go through here. And I'm going to make a point. Psalm 119 verses 9 through 18. Verse 9. Got your pencil? How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. Circle word. Verse 9. Verse 10. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandment. Circle commandment. Now, this is from the ESV version, so yours might have a different word here and there, but circle whatever word is in the place of commandments. Verse 11, your word, circle word, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Verse 12, blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. Verse 13, with my lips I have declared all the judgments. Circle the word judgments of your mouth. Verse 14, I have rejoiced in the ways of your testimonies. Circle testimonies. As much as in all riches. Verse 15, I will meditate on your precepts. Circle precepts. And have respect unto your ways. Circle ways. The ways directly refer to God's direction through his word. Verse 16, I will delight myself in your statutes, circle statutes. I will not forget your word, circle word. Verse 17, deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word, circle the word, word. And then verse 18, open my eyes that I might behold wondrous things from your law. 
circle law. Now, if you look at all those, there's a whole lot of different words that mean statutes, law, word, precepts, concepts, ways. All of these things refer to the same general direction or reference to the word of God. God's word to his people are referred to in a, in a variety of ways, but law in the Old Testament and word of God is basically synonymous. The law of God and the word of God is basically synonymous. And we believe the Bible, God's holy word, remember 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God. How much is scripture? All scripture. Every bit of it, every line of it, every word of it, every jot and tittle of it, as the Bible says. All of God's word is inspired. Because it's inspired, we believe it to be inerrant. Inerrant refers to there be no errors in how God transmitted his truth from his heart and his mind to us today through human authors. The human authors were the people who wrote them, who heard God speak and wrote down his word. Inerrancy, the inerrancy of scripture refers to God giving his word through those human authors as they wrote them down perfectly and without any error whatsoever. The idea is the transmission of God. He was transmitted, his word was transmitted from heaven to earth, from his heart and mind to ours, inerrantly. It was transmitted inerrantly. And the original autographs, which were the things written down in the author's original handwriting that we don't have today, those were referred to autographs. And those were inerrant. Likewise, we believe the word, the law, the precepts, the commandments of God to be infallible. That is, it is perfectly accurate in everything it contains. If it talks about the Hittites, then guess what? There were such a people as Hittites, even though they hadn't discovered any archaeology to confirm it until a couple of years ago, by the way. That was one of the arguments of the liberals. They would say, well, the Bible speaks of Hittites. There's no indication that Hittite people or civilization ever existed. Lo well, and behold, they find some pottery and inscriptions and writings talking all about the Hittites. So everything mentioned in the Bible is accurate. That mean infallibility means it is there are no inaccuracies in the contents of the scriptures. Inerrancy means there's no error in how it was transmitted from heaven to us. All of those refer in effect the authority of scripture for us. If we know it's inspired by Almighty God from his heart and mind to us, if we know that it's been transmitted inherently, if we know it's the content is beyond inaccuracies, then we can believe what it says. And we can know for sure that every promise, every commandment, every prophecy is true in it. If we doubt any of those things, then we will always be doubting did God really mean that? Or was it really true, like that says? Because of inspiration, inerrancy, and infallibility, the Bible is fully authoritative in all areas in which it addresses, including the Old Testament law. So, introduction. What is the value of the Old Testament law of God in the life of the true believing Christian? Number one. It was two weeks to get here to point number one, but here we are, number one. What's the value of Old Testament law? Number one. The law of God presents the relationship between God and his people, whether they be the Jews or the Christians. And please write that down. The law of God, the value of the law of God is that it presents the relationship between God and his people. The law of God presents examples of how God dealt with the Jewish people. It presents examples of the prosperity of God's people and the propensity to rebel against God once having gained his prosperity. 
So there is historical space. I just thought about this this morning. Just dawned on me with all the goofy things going on about the history, trying to scrub America's history. Here we are. The historical value of the Old Testament law must never be underestimated. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians 10. We've got two passages in 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10. Verse 11, raise your hand when you're there. 1 Corinthians 10. Got your pencil. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. Now these things, I want you to underline these things. And if you can, over the top of the words, these things, just write OT. Stands for Old Testament. This is what he's referring to. These things, or the historical information from the Old Testament, these things happened, that is, the events of God dealing with his people, Israel, in the Old Testament, these things happened to them, to the Israelites, as examples. Wow. So these things, the Old Testament events and lessons happened to them as examples, but they, they, again, Old Testament, they were written down. These lessons were written down. God dealing with his people and the lessons were written down for our, get this, for our, and, and, and Paul is talking from a New Testament perspective well after Jesus was crucified, resurrected, and ascended. So we're into the church age, okay? This is the same age that we're living in now. Written down for our instruction for the church today. Our instruction on whom has come, the end of the ages has come. So Paul says all of the historical events between God and his people, all the lessons that they learned, many of them quite painful, those, those were examples for us today as believers. They were written down for our instruction as New Testament believers on whom the end of the age has come. Because it's valuable because it's historical documentation of God dealing with his people. And through that we can learn not just what God expects from us but what we can expect from God. God deals with his people this way. He may deal with us very similarly. We know that God's word is truth. And God's Old Testament instructs us how to worship acceptably, how to view him acceptably. It teaches us how to treat our fellow man acceptably. The Bible addresses relationships with God, relationships with others, and what God expects from us, and what we can expect from God. And in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul recounts the story of the Hebrew children, and I'd encourage you to go back and read the entire chapter 10 after church sometime. But in that chapter, he recounts the Jewish people Enjoying God's provision as physical and spiritual blessings with both physical and spiritual food. He also speaks out about their sexual immoralities that were going on, their idolatries. And at one point they were even overthrown in the wilderness and they were just almost consumed by serpents, fiery serpents. Wouldn't it be great to learn whatever that is so that God doesn't repeat that on us, wouldn't it? But now 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6, back up a little bit to verse 6. Now these things, underline that and put OT over these things. Again, that's referring to the Old Testament depiction of what happens to the Jewish people. Now these things took place as examples, there we go again. Examples for us, and what is the purpose? Somebody read the rest of that out loud for everybody else in case I got it wrong. Now, these things took place as examples for us that 
I can't hear it. That we should not desire evil as they did. All of these things in the lives of the Jewish people, how God dealt with his people. Harshly, but we would have to agree mercifully as well. And God superintended that to be written down in Holy Scripture, inspired, inerrant, infallible, beyond any inaccuracy. That has come to us today so that we will learn a valuable lesson and that we don't have to learn it all over again. That we not desire evil as they did. I don't know, makes us want to ask another question. Have we learned that lesson? But this is the learning, the, the, the lesson from us. The things that were documented in the Old Testament law of God. For what reason? Warnings. Do not repeat this. Red flags. Don't let this happen in your life, Jeff. In the church's life. Don't let these things come upon you. Sexual immoralities, idolatries, but a whole lot more. Now, convenience is the enemy can cause us to remove and unhitch that cumbersome, weighty, inconvenient caboose on this train. The caboose of Old Testament law. Just get rid of it. Unhitch it. Let it go. Let this train pick up some speed. That's holding us back. If we could just pick up speed, we'd be more relevant. People would appreciate it more. They would get more people. Well, oh, the devil could just make us swallow that hook, line, and sinker. Imagine the victory that he will have accomplished. Turn to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Romans 15 and verse 4. For whatever was written in earlier times, there it is again. Whatever is written, he's referring to Old Testament law. Because remember, the, whole the New Testament hasn't been put together yet. So for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. That through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures. What are the scriptures that he's referring to? The Old Testament law. New Testament doesn't exist as documents. Doesn't even exist. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for the instruction for us. That through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures we might find hope. Is it kind of dawning on you why the devil wants to con con convince the church of 2020 that the Old Testament law is just a bunch of weighty baggage? That it's just a law, that we're not under law, we're under grace to so get rid of that. Symbolize it, figuratize it, do something with it, allegorize it. But don't make it really, don't make it, you know, really apply to our lives in any way. That sounds too negative. That sounds like God doesn't want us really happy or something. You know, that sounds crazy. I thought we had a God of love. He has all these things that we have to be bound by. Imagine if the devil could just get us to bite that bait. That we would discount the value of Old Testament law, scripture, the inspired, inerrant, infallible, authorized word of God for the church today. And I want to repeat, I want to repeat this. The fact that that's valuable to us in no way implies that we are saved by keeping any rules. That was never the case. People who quote that, they quote that, oh, but we're no longer under law, we're under grace, as though the people in the Old Testament were. 
as though they weren't under grace. As though they were saved by keeping the law. They were not. They were not saved by keeping the law. Not the case. I encourage you to do a word search on your Bible program or if you have a, a what do they call that big book we used to have? A concordance or something like that? I almost forget what it's called. I know, I know. Strong concordance. I almost forget what that's called. And just do a search on the word grace. Just grace throughout the Old Testament. Almost always connected with mercy. Almost always connected with God not destroying the Hebrew people. So because we're not saying well, we're, we're, not, we're not under law, we're under grace. And no one has ever been saved, not in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament, by keeping the law. It's always been grace. It's always been through faith. Abraham believed God and kept the Ten Commandments. But Abraham believed God and what? It was credited to him as righteousness. Old Testament salvation and New Testament salvation. The law, Old Testament law of God presents the relationships between God and his people. So I want you to to remember today, the law of God, the Old Testament law of God helps us to understand what God expects from us, but also what we can expect from God, how God dealt with his people. We learn all of that by the Old Testament law, by the Old Testament dealings and writings, so that we can look today and say, wow, the Jewish people are still in existence. What a miracle. What an act of God's grace. What evidence of his mercy. And so we begin to learn how, what God's character is like, how he deals with his people, what he expects of us and what we can expect from him. I would encourage you to continue reading through uh, this chapter, Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be here a while, looks like. I think this is just one of the more important, uh, relevant aspects of the church today. Because I don't believe it's the pagans, I don't believe it's the government, I don't believe it's China causing all of our problems. I believe it's churches that when we're tempted to discount even the slightest aspect of God's word and consider it devalued, irrelevant, or not for us today, then we are guilty of the problems that will occur because of that. Holy Father, we thank you, Lord, for your error-free word, for your content-accurate word, for the fully authorized word from your heart and mind to our heart and mind through inspiration, Lord. We want to we take time and grasp that, Lord. Help us to grasp that, Lord. Your Old Testament law was so important. It was such an important part of your thought and your heart that you saw fit to make sure we got it and we got it clear. So we thank you, Lord, for the Old Testament. We thank you for the New Testament. All of your scriptures, all of your truth that you've given us. Lord, help us to know you better. Help us to know what you expect of us, but Lord, help us to know what to expect of you, the assurance and promises that we have in that. We'll thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.